hearty welcome to you all to this very special service today. May God help us to, to receive His Word and uh, be loyal and true to Him. Uh, regards from our family, uh, they, are, they are scattered around in the, in the Cape province. And um, I hope you are doing well during this lockdown period. I have found it is not all negative. Some very positive things have surfaced through this experience for me and my family. This morning, God impressed me to share something I'm personally battling with for a while now. And the title is, Your Character Determines Your Destiny. And I must say, the lockdown period has played a big role in me understanding this a little bit better. I would like to, to invite you to turn your Bibles to 1 Peter 1, verse 15 and verse 16. 1 Peter 1, verse 15 and verse 16. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Let's pray. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, the scripture reading is a, is a whole mouthful. Lord, you are directing us and you are commanding us to be holy as you are holy. And Lord, immediately there is a reaction within us because we are so sinful and we are so unworthy of even uh, thinking of, of being more like you. And we pray, Lord, that you would be with us this morning that you would guide our thoughts, that you would help us, Lord, to, to put principles in place so that we can cooperate with you in you wanting to change our characters so that we can be more like you. Thank you, Lord, for doing this for us. In Jesus' name, amen. A few weeks ago, I was confronted with something that really got my mind in gear. With regards to, to character building, I visited a man, let's call him Uncle Ronnie, that is suffering from Alzheimer's disease. I looked after him for most part of the day and I knew him fairly well before he started showing the symptoms of this condition. However, I was shocked that he did not even know who I was. And throughout the day, he was only doing that which he habitually did most in his life. Now listen to this. He read his Bible. He looked at Hope Channel. And then he prayed and repeated this action throughout the day. There was no cognitive brain function and I realized that his door of probation has shut somewhere in the last months or so. There seems to be no cognitive connection with, with God and with reality around him. Now, this is a position I would never want to be in. Or am I actually in such a position. You see, the total lockdown, as bad as it was for many, had some positive outcomes for some, I'm sure. I started understanding the positive or the negative effects isolation has on a marriage relationship. I started to realize that our spouses really plays a major role in this process of Character building. Being in each other's space for this extended time leads to deep experiences. In our case, 
Edna made me aware of some disastrous character traits that I've carried with me in my life. The natural human reaction is to, to fight this, to justify it. You know, I'm not such a bad person. My dear wife, it is your own, you know, warped mind allowing you to see all these things. I'm not like that. And it took me days and many wrestles to realize these bad traits are true and potentially will keep me out of heaven. Stuff I was not really aware of. It was never a real problem for me and in our marriage and for my wife. But now it surfaced. Then I started reading and researching and one statement after another confirmed my reality. You know, I am in trouble. The book, Education, page 225, paragraph 3 says, Character building is the most important work ever entrusted to human beings. And never before was its diligent study so important as now. Never was any previous generation called to meet issues so momentous. Never before were young men and young women confronted by perils so great as confront them today. Now this was written in 1903. But it's like it was written for me in 2020. What about you? Look at this next statement in Christ Object Lessons, page 332. A character formed according to the divine likeness is the only treasure that we can take from this world to the next. Now you understand why the title for this uh, message today is Your Character Determines Your Destiny. But let's read the rest of the, of the statement. Those who are under the instruction of Christ in the world will take every divine attainment with them to the heavenly mansions. And in heaven, we are continually to improve. How important then is the development of character in this life? I have an idea that many of us wrongly assume that when Jesus comes and he changes our mortal bodies into immortal beings, and that happens in a twinkle of an eye, he also transforms our character to be like his. Now this is wrong thinking. You see, our bodies will be changed in a twinkle of an eye. Yes, all the scars I have of the cancer and subsequent treatment will be gone. Praise God for that. However, my character gets taken to heaven as is. All the traits I have acquired here on earth is what I will have with me in heaven. Now this is a scary thought. If I have a dislike for certain people, those, dislike, those, those dislikes will still be with me in heaven. If I dislike fresh fruit on earth, I will find myself in a, a position where I would be very grumpy in heaven. As this is what we will be eating there. So, my brothers and sisters, character is not what others think you are, but what you are when no one else is around. So, when we ask the question, what is character? Here is a definition. It says, if the thoughts are wrong, the feelings will be wrong. And the thoughts and the feelings combined make up the moral character. So my thoughts and my feelings combined make up the moral character. Now I need to borrow a picture from the Brain Power series to explain this concept. And by the way, do yourself a favor and look at the series. You will find it on the YouTube channel under Brain Power Seminars. 
So when we look at this um, chart of the anatomy of a habit, we find that our senses trigger our thoughts, and our thoughts then filter it through principle or feelings. That leads to an action, and the action after I've done whatever I've done leaves me with a feeling, a feeling of okay or not okay. And this is really what a habit consists of. So when I would have a feeling of not okay with myself, not okay with others, maybe even not okay with God, that means it's most likely a bad habit. But if, I like, if I've done something and I feel okay with regards to it with others, with myself, with God, it most likely would be a good habit. Now we need to know that habits is what forms my character. And the only thing I can take to heaven, and we read the statement, is my character. Christ Object Lessons, this is a beautiful book, page 356, paragraph 2, says the following. Thus actions repeated from habits, or form habits, habits form character, and by this character, our destiny for time and for eternity is decided. Now, I just want to re-emphasize. It is the stimuli that leads to my thoughts and my feelings. That leads to an action. These actions is the habits that I form. And that really determines my character and my character is what determines my destiny. Now the next statement will, will blow you away. It blew me away. To give glory to God is to reveal His character in our own. And thus making Him known. See, one of my pet subjects is the sanctuary. In one of the presentations on the sanctuary... Last year, a number of members had questions when I started. Uh, well, I stated that it is in the most holy place where perfection of character takes place. And there was quite a stir around this concept. You see, God is busy right now in the work of perfection of character if we would allow Him. God will make perfect only those who will die for self. Look at the statement that says, The greatest work that can be done in our world is to glorify God by living the character of Christ. God will make perfect only those who will die for self. God will only make perfect those who will die to self. That's, a, that's the hardest thing to do. You know, so part of the preparing the character is to die of self. This is something we are not teaching Christians in any way. We teach that people should stand up for their rights. We never die to self. And this might be one of the reasons why the Lord is delaying His second coming. When character, Christ object lessons, Page 69, paragraph 1 says, When character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, when he will come to claim them as his own. In 1844, Jesus moved from the most, from the holy place to the most holy place. Now, I've borrowed this diagram from the sanctuary presentation you'll see that it, it has a timeline. It has a timeline where Jesus, in his earthly ministry, in the sanctuary that is in heaven, represented on earth by a physical sanctuary, that is where the sacrifice of Jesus took place. That is where the, the Jesus' baptism would take place. That, that re that's represented by the, by the labor. And, and then... Jesus went into the heavenly 
um, ministry of, of his, his high priest's ship. In the holy place, we find, you know, a, a few very important furniture that makes it important for us to understand that the Holy Spirit is represented there, the Word of God is represented there, and prayer and intercession is represented there. And from there, Jesus, in 1844, moved into the most holy place. And he is busy with an investigative judgment at this point. The Great Controversy, page 428, paragraph 1, says the following. The work of examination of character, of determining who are prepared for the kingdom of God, is that of the investigative judgment. The closing of work in the sanctuary above. Page 488, paragraph 2 of the same book says, The subject of the sanctuary and the investigative judgment should be clearly understood by the people of God. My brothers and sisters, we are living right at the end. And so we need to be, be prepared. Because this is, the next event is the glorification, is when Jesus will come. Let's go on and look at that statement. All need a knowledge for themselves of the position and the work of the great high priest. Otherwise, it will be impossible for them to exercise the faith which is essential at this time or to occupy the position which God designs them to fill. So what is this position that God designs for me and you to fill? Why do we need a character like none have had before. Because we will go through a time that has never been before. And now is not the time to hide be behind something we say so easily. Lord, I cannot help it. You know, in Afri Afrikaans there's a saying, Ekesuche maak en ekesu laat staan. So directly translated it means, I was made like this and I was left like this. If we have excuses for our defects of character, instead of seeking God's transforming power, we will find that those defects will cause us to yield under the pressure. Look at this amazing statement out of the book, Sanctified, The Sanctified Life. It's page 7, paragraph 2. Those who are really seeking to perfect Christian character will never indulge in the thought that they are sinless. Their lives may be in irreproachable. They may be living representatives of the truth which they have accepted. But the more they discipline their minds to dwell upon the character of Christ and the nearer they approach to His divine image, the more clearly will they discern its spotless perfection. And the more deeply will they feel their own defects. Oh, this is a mouthful. How then do we cooperate in building our character? Well, let's look at just four important factors today. And I want to thank Richard and Jenny Lovemore. They are, they are good friends of mine for not only teaching me these principles, but actually defining these four important steps to build character. The first one is surrender and cooperation. The second one is prayerful evaluation. The third factor of character building is to behold. The fourth one is to cultivate opposite traits. So let's start unpacking these. When we talk about surrender and co cooperation, what, is it, what does this mean? What does... What do we mean by, by saying that, uh, you know, we need to surrender, we need to cooperate? In the little book, Thoughts on the Mount of Blessing, page 62, we find this powerful statement. Our will is to be yielded to Him, that we may receive it again, purified and refined. So what is the first thing? Is surrender and cooperation. 
So when we give our will to the Lord, we yield it to the Lord, He will give it back to us refined. So I give my character to Him, I surrender it to Him, He gives it back to me purified, refined. The following statement says it all. And it's found in Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 141. The Christian life is a battle and a march. But the victory to be gained is not won by human power. The field of conflict is the domain of the heart. The battle which we have to fight, the greatest battle that was ever fought by man, is the surrender of self to the will of God, the yielding of the heart to the sovereignty of love. It goes on, it says, the old nature, born of blood and of the will of the flesh, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. The hereditary tendencies, the former habits, must be given up. He who determines to enter the spiritual kingdom will find that all the powers and the passions of an unregenerate nature, backed by the forces of the kingdom of darkness, are arrayed against him. So what is these, these hereditary tendencies, the former habits that must be given up? It is, and listen to this, it is selfishness, it is pride that will make a stand against anything that would show them to be sinful. This is, by the way, the time that we would Stand up for our rights. Let's, let's complete this statement. We cannot of ourselves conquer the evil desires and the habits that strife for the mastery. We cannot overcome the mighty foe who holds us in his, in his trail. God alone can give us the victory. He desires us. To have the mastery over ourselves, our own will and ways. Now, I want you to listen to this very, very carefully now. Listen to this. He cannot work in us without our consent and our cooperation. He will not magically just rid us of all our tendencies we need to cooperate with God. I cannot just praise, uh, pray, please, Lord, change me. And wham, I'm a new person. The reality is he will only do this with our cooperation, our willing surrender, our consent. And for some of us, when we talk surrender, it means give up. Consent means you're second best. And that is not true. That's not true. Look at this. He cannot work in us without our consent and our cooperation. I'm somewhat relieved after reading this statement. I'm sure um, you might have battled with this as I have trying to be a better person but you fall and you fail and then you try again and you fail again it feels as if we get nowhere we we're treading in the water we're staying at one place we we even going backwards we are going to exhort energy in cooperating with god we, we're going to have to put in effort, people. There's effort needed. It's going to be painful because your wife, if you pray this, it's scary things. Your wife will tell you about things that you never knew and that would really be very scary. Listen to this. Page 142. Paragraph 7 of the, the book, Mount of Blessings. The victory is not one, without much earnest prayer, without the humbling of self at every step. 
Our will is not to be forced into cooperation with divine agencies, but it must be voluntarily submitted where it's possible to force upon you with a hundredfold greater intensity the influence of the Holy Spirit. It would not make you a Christian, a fit subject for heaven. What's needed is a willing surrender, a willing pick up the white flag. Voluntary submission is needed. And you see, the world is teaching us exactly the opposite. You know what I am I'm really shocked about is that even within our church, we are taught that you have to stand up for your rights. And here the Lord says, no, no. You need to voluntarily submit. Especially the stronghold that Satan has in your life. Look at the statement. The stronghold of Satan would not be broken. The will must be placed on the side of God's will. You are not able of yourself to bring your purposes and your desires and inclinations into submission to the will of God. But if you are willing to be made willing, God will accomplish the work for you. And this is the crux of today's message, I believe. Am I willing to allow God to accomplish this great work in me? Even casting down imaginations. I'm reading from the Mount of Blessing, page 142, paragraph 1. And every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So, what is the strongholds of of Satan, its imaginations, my thoughts that are not obedient to Christ. Well, this is what I need in my life. I don't know about you. This is what I desire. I desire to be obedient to Jesus Christ up to death with my will surrendered to God. Then you will work at your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Philippians 2 verse 12 and 13. By the way, that was still the quote from the Mount of Blessing, page 142, paragraph 1. Now, here is something we need to emphasize. I want us to emphasize the following. While our salvation is wholly dependent upon Jesus, we have a work to do in order that we may be saved. The apostle says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God that worketh in you both to will and to do of his great pleasure. Now, the work that we are to do is not independent of what God is to do but a work of cooperation with God and this is where most of us go off the rails we need to understand it is not something I can do if it was so then it would be called my works save myself our only action is to cooperate with God so let's look at the second fact in character building and that is prayerful evaluation. This means we have to make our list. Is my character in line with God's will? And that's prayerful evaluating it. Do I perhaps not always tell the truth? Or just add something to the truth to emphasize my point? Do I love just relaxing and watching worldly movies? Well, as everybody else does. 
whatever is not in harmony with God's will, my brother and sister, you might find when you start this process, it seems like you don't have any flaws in your character. But when you start praying and you start asking God to open and to reveal to you, 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5 says, Examine yourself. Whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves. We have to examine. And this examining might be painful experience, as things you were never aware of might pop up. The book, Second Testimonies, page 81, paragraph 1, says, Closely examine your own heart as in the light of eternity. Hide nothing from your examination. Search, oh search, as for your life, and condemn yourself. Pass judgment upon yourself, and then by faith claim the cleansing blood of Christ to remove the stains from your Christian character. Do not flatter or excuse yourself. Deal truly with your own soul. This is not the time to say, well, mark and ekesul at stan. People, I know this is truly straight talk. This is the reason why we have to follow Jesus in the most holy place. I was confronted with this during the sanctuary sermon, as I said a few months back. Pastor, how can you say we must go into the most holy place where Jesus is? Only He is holy. Only He can enter the most holy place. My question then is, Jesus says, be ye holy as I am holy. He says, I want to help you. Just surrender. Submit. Cooperate with me. Evaluate your own life. You see, the, the road to salvation is a, is a progressive process. We would accept Jesus Christ and what he did at the cross and that's what the altar of offering uh, altar of sacrifice meant and then we would go to the laver where they would be washing and that symbolizes the washing off of all our sins through baptism and Jesus actually set that example on earth and he did that he, he, he went through the process But where is Jesus right now? He is in the most holy place, busy with the investigative judgment. In the same book, uh, Testimonies to the Church, that's the second volume, page 511, paragraph 2, I see this very personal message. It's like it was written for me. It says, If ministers, now by the way, it could be every one of us, would make the actions of each day a subject of careful thought and deliberate review with the object to become acquainted with their own habits of life, they would better know themselves. By a close scrutiny of their daily life under all circumstances, they would know their own motives, the principles which actuate them. This is truly straight talk, isn't it? That's not all. The paragraph continues. This daily review of our acts to see whether conscience approves or condemns is necessary for all who wish to arrive at the perfection of Christian character. The realities of this is spelled out in the next paragraph. Many acts which pass for good works, even deeds of benevolence, will, when closely investigated, be found to be prompted by wrong motives. Many receive applause for virtues which they do not possess. The search of hearts inspects motives, and often the deeds which are highly applauded by men are recorded by him as springing from selfish motives and base hypocrisy. Even good deeds might be actioned by warped motives. 
Why are you doing good deeds? Why are you returning tithe? Why are, are you giving food parcels to those that look hungry? What is the motive? Listen to this. Every act of our lives, whether excellent and praiseworthy and deserving of censure, is judged by the searcher of hearts according to the motives which prompted it. Now, this is scary stuff, my brother and my sister. God does not look at what you have done, but even why you have done it. So how else could we help building our character? By beholding. The Bible says by beholding we are changed. Second Corinthians. But we all with our face having been unveiled, having beheld the glory of the Lord as in a mirror, are being changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Lord's Spirit. Spend time studying Jesus' life. Study His character. Study the lives of people who reflect His character. And you will become more like Him. Patriarchs and Prophets Five, page one, 596, paragraph 2 says, It is a law of the mind that it gradually adapts itself to the subjects upon which it is trained to dwell. In the reverent contemplation of the truths presented in his word, the mind of the student is brought into communion with the infinite mind. Such a study will not only refine and enable, ennoble the character, but it cannot fail to expand and invigorate the mental powers. It is a law of the mind that it gradually adapts itself to the subjects upon which it is trained to dwell. I become that which I expose myself to. And then the fourth and the last point we want to emphasize today is to cultivate opposite traits. Practice the things you want to develop. Isaiah 1 verse 16 and 17 says, Wash yourself, make yourself clean, put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes, cease to the devil, learn to do good, Seek judgment, reproof the oppressor, judge the orphan, plead for the widow. In the book, book Testimonies, the third volume, page 558, it gives us a very practical application. Please turn your eyes to this. By preservingly cultivating the opposite traits of those wherein you now fail, you may learn to overcome those deficiencies in your character which have see increased from your youth. So there's certain things that we have started doing while we were, were a child. And in our youth, it was, it was strengthened. And now as an adult, we have that with us and... Those characteristics is those that could keep us out of heaven. And we need to just try and do the opposite. If I'm not always speaking the truth, I will now preservingly cultivate an opposite trait. Just speak factual truth. I gave an example. In the book, Lift Him Up, Page 367, we find the practical way of dealing with this. Please look at this with me on the screen. When he sees a weakness in his character, it is not enough to confess it again and again. He must go to work with determination and energy to overcome the defects by building up opposite traits of character. Wow, this is amazing. 
This is so amazing. Christ Optic Lessons, page 354 says, While we yield ourselves as instruments for the Holy Spirit's work, working, the grace of God works in us to deny old inclinations, to overcome powerful propensities, and to form new habits. As we cherish and obey the promptings of the Spirit, our hearts are enlarged to receive more and more of His power and to do more and better work. We find this powerful quote in Messages young, to Young People, page 348. It says, you can never secure a good character by merely wishing for it. It can be gained only by labor. People, I cannot just sit and wait for the Lord's coming while I roll my thumbs. Expecting Him in a twinkle of an eye, boom, to just change my character. I'm repeating this because I see many Christians have a totally wrong concept about this. You see, we are working hard to keep our body and soul together. To keep a roof over our heads. Prepare, prepare for retirement, to secure an ins in, in inheritance for our children, etc., etc. But I need to remind you what the most important thing is to work on right now, our own characters. It is not just going to be there with a snap of the finger. The book of the book Child Guidance is a great source of help. It says, Page 161, paragraph 1 says, A character formed according to the divine likeness is the only treasure that we can take from this world to the next. I cannot take my car. I cannot take my wife. I cannot take my children. I cannot take my possessions. I cannot take my money. Those who are under the instruction of Christ in this world will take every divine attainment with them to the heavenly mansions. And in heaven we are continually to improve. How important then is the development of character in this life. May God have mercy on us. May we cooperate with Him in His great work of character building. My greatest desire is to be like Jesus. What is your greatest desire? My my late uncle was an evangelist and he used to sing this song in his evangelistical meetings, especially there in the rural Eastern Cape area. He was known as my desire. People know him when they spoke about, they didn't say Pastor Neoff, they spoke about my desire. I want you to sing this beautiful little hymn with me today. My desire. May this come out of your heart as you sing this prayerfully. My desire to be like Jesus. My desire to be like Him. His Spirit fills me, His love overwhelms me, in deed and word, to be like Him. My desire to be like Jesus, my desire to be like Him. His Spirit fills me, His love overwhelms me, in deed and word, to be like Him. Let's pray together. Gracious Father in Heaven, our biggest desire is to be like Jesus. Thank you, Father, that you have sent your Son to die for our sins. Thank you for that great love. And Lord, thank you that you want to change our characters. 
to be more like the character of Jesus. And thank you, Lord, that you've reminded us today that we have a responsibility to allow you to cooperate with you in doing this. Help us, Lord, to, to evaluate our position. Help us, Lord, to, to practice opposite traits. And thank you, Lord, that by beholding, by beholding Jesus, we can make, be made new. Our characters can be made new. I pray a very special blessing on each one that listens or watches this message. And I humbly thank you, Lord, for touching hearts today. In Jesus' name. Amen. May God bless you. May God guide you as you strive to be more like Him.